Welcome, I'm Prudence Robertson, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Overturning Roe. The debate continues as the nation anxiously awaits the final decision in the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization case. We cover how pro-abortion Democrats are moving to codify Roe on Capitol Hill with Senate Pro-Life Caucus Chair Senator Steve Daines and House Freedom Caucus member Rep Andy Biggs. Bringing it to the states, we take a look at how the Dobbs decision, if upheld, would impact abortion legislation in the states. We speak to Attorney General Mark Burnovich of Arizona about his state's new pro-life law and what his state plans to do when Roe is overturned. Educating through film. A new film seeks to share the truth behind abortion. Tracy Robinson, the producer and director of The Matter of Life, joins us to discuss the pro-life film as well as her journey from being pro-abortion to pro-life. We continue to look to the U.S. Supreme Court, which could at any time move to overturn Roe v. Wade. In reaction, U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer ordered a vote this week to codify the findings of Roe in the law. Due to razor-thin majorities in the Senate, Democrats do not have the votes needed to succeed in their efforts to force all states to allow abortions up until the moment of birth. Majority Leader Schumer has called the Supreme Court justices and Republicans in Congress, quote, extreme. This comes as we continue to wait for the official decision in the Dobbs case. Joining us now is the head of the Senate Pro-Life Caucus, Senator Steve Daines of Montana. Senator, thanks for joining me. The ironically named Women's Health Protection Act is up again for a vote in the Senate. Can you tell us more about this extreme pro-abortion bill? Well, first of all, they've labeled it the wrong way. It should be called the Abortion on Demand Until Birth Act. This is a barbaric and radical abortion bill. Uh, the Democrats, sadly, want every single state to be a late-term abortion state. And of course, sadly, this would put the United States in the same category of just seven countries in the world that permit late-term abortions, including China and North Korea. The United States would be the most dangerous place in the world for an unborn baby to be if the Democrats have their way. So this is a, it's a horrible, horrible bill that uh, uh, I'm just, it, it's sad to see that it would come to this, that you would see this on the floor of the United States Senate. Mm. And since the Supreme Court leak has happened of Justice Alito's draft, pro-abortion Democrats have expressed outrage at the idea that now people in the states will get to decide what their laws on abortion should be. You have said that if this decision stands, it will allow the court to correct a historical injustice and return the power to the American people. Talk to me a little more about that. Well, that's exactly what the facts are, what the truth is with this, uh, this draft opinion that was leaked that Justice Alito wrote. Uh, if that indeed is the final decision of the court, what that decision does is it returns the power from nine men in black robes from 1973, it returns the power to elected officials. That's where it belongs. It belongs with our state legislatures to debate about what protection we want to put in place for babies. Uh, it still will belong as a federal debate here in Washington, but the bottom line is you're not going to have this uh, mandate that came down from the court, this right, so-called right that was created by the United States Supreme Court. So this decision from the Supreme Court will be profound, uh, and this leak, by the way, I need, need to add, is outrageous. This was done simply to intimidate members of the court. And we're seeing that, sadly, uh, as we speak. We're seeing these protests. We're seeing death threats. The fact that Supreme Court justices have to have uh, ramped up protection. You realize in the last 48 hours, we just quickly passed a bill in the United States Senate allowing more security protection for Supreme Court justices. Mm. Let's talk a little more about that breach of trust. Could you give us an update on the investigation into who might have done this? Are we going to find out what consequences could that person or persons be facing? Yeah, well, I'm confident uh, they'll get to the bottom of this because the, the list of individuals that could have leaked that is a, is a short list. Every Supreme Court justice has four law clerks. So it's not a big list. 
I'm confident they'll get to the bottom of who it was. And, uh, and in terms of penalties, well, that remains to be seen. But frankly, the damages that are already been uh, created on the court are something that will be, I think, almost irreparable. It, we violated the trust of the court. Remember, uh, Justice Ginsburg, who had very different views from Justice Scalia, uh, they still could work together in a collegial way. They could trust each other. The court has to deal with a lot of confidentiality when they deliberate. That has not been violated in this, in this manner of a breach to this magnitude until what happened last week. So it, it's, it's really, again, another sad moment in our history of our country where those who seek to intimidate justices to get their particular outcome would basically do whatever it takes, including breaching the confidence of the United States Supreme Court. Well, we will certainly continue to track that. And just one final question for you. As we wait for the final decision on the Dobbs case, what more can we expect from these abortion activists in D.C.? And what are you doing on your end as head of the Senate Pro-Life Caucus to ensure that we're protecting these unborn children? Well, th this battle only increases. And, and I want to thank so many of uh, your listeners and viewers who've been praying diligently for decades uh, for this moment. Uh, this means now that we the battle goes out to the states. The battle will stay here in Washington, but now it expands to the state legislatures, our governors. It's more important than ever for our pro-life activists to even double down in their efforts of working hard in their states to ensure that we protect the lives of these babies and their moms. So this is not a time to sit back. Uh, yeah, we should celebrate uh, this, this pending ruling, but it is time to double down our efforts here to protect the lives of moms and babies. Mm, and we will continue to pray and pray for you, Senator, as you defend the unborn. Thank you so much, Senator Steve Daines of Montana. Thank you. To continue the conversation, we're joined by House Republican Representative Andy Biggs of Arizona. Representative Biggs, thanks for joining me. You've been very active on Twitter in reaction to the Supreme Court leak and all that's ensued since. I would love if you could share more details about your tweet saying that pro-abortion radicals are breaking the law by picketing outside of the Supreme Court justices' homes. Yeah, there's federal law under, under Title 18 that pro, uh, prohibits uh, protesting uh, in front of federal judges' homes. I mean, just kind of what we, we what you just said. And the idea behind that law is to prevent intimidation of uh, judges who are considering weighty matters by mobs of angry people. Uh, you want an independent judiciary, and the time to influence the judge is when you're filing briefs and your attorneys uh, and representatives are, are making arguments, not going to their homes and intimidating them and by the way, it, this goes beyond just protesting in front of their houses. They've received death threats. Their families have received threats, and they've had to, they've they've actually had to move um, uh, uh, Justice Alito. Right. And Democrats on Capitol Hill are clearly outraged, and that comes as no surprise. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the draft opinion by Justice Alito, quote, slapped women in the face. She even said we need to be prayerful about finding ways to keep abortion legal. What are your thoughts on her remarks? I, I find them to be highly offensive, to be praying to God uh, to provide ways to abort um, innocent unborn babies in the womb. I mean, to me, that is the height the height of, of inhumanity uh, is to basically justify an evil conduct by relying on God. And that's what they're doing here. These, these, these little uh, innocents are, are uh, basically uh, in the care and nurture of the, the mother in the womb. And, and uh, she's praying to God. And she says, we need to pray to God to um, invoke basically murderous appetite on these poor innocent children. Mm. And what are your thoughts, Representative Biggs, on the breach of trust at the court with this leak? Do you think it's possible we find the person who leaked this draft? Can we really rely on the Department of Justice to do anything about all of this? What do you think? Well, I, I never uh, rely on the, the senior leaders of the DOJ, but um, Chief Justice Roberts has enlisted the marshal's office to come in and to investigate. I hope we find out who it was. Um, I've been sitting in a hearing, and, and the audacity is, is that Democrats have been sitting in this hearing saying, oh, well, you know, it's, uh, it had to be a conservative because it would lock in these conservative votes. Those conservative votes uh, are locked in 
already uh, in the Alito draft, and that's that's why it's it's the draft. And so, uh, I don't believe it was a conservative person who leaked it, but whoever leaked it undermined the credibility and trust of the Supreme Court, and they they need to be found out, and they should probably be fired. Uh, and disciplined otherwise. Mm. Appreciate your thoughts on all of this. Representative Andy Biggs of Arizona, thank you. Thanks, Prudence. Joining us now is Dr. Tara Sander Lee, Senior Fellow and Director of Life Sciences at the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Tara, thanks for joining us. A recent Fox News poll found that the majority of Americans support a limit on abortion at six weeks. That's significantly earlier than we've seen in the past. Why do you mm -hmm. think that is? You know, I'm actually not surprised. I mean, America is starting to understand how the abortion industry has lied to them for 50 years. Science reveals the undeniable humanity of the unborn child like never before, and the American people are responding with compassion to protect these children. Um, a recent poll by Susan B. Anthony List actually found really similar results to the Fox News poll. Most Imp Americans in key battle states, like my own state here in Wisconsin, reject abortion on demand and support support candidates that put limits on abortion compared to extreme Democrats who support unlimited abortion for any reason right up until the moment of birth. Mm -hmm. So the American people from across the country, they want to the limit on abortion at all stages of pregnancy because they know, they know in their heart, they know because science reveals this, that the unborn child is a living human being at six weeks when the heart is beating to up to 15 weeks when she feels pain. So the Americans are tired of age-old lie from the abortion lobby that the unborn are just of all cells. They, they know better. Science has revealed the undeniable humanity of the unborn child, and they're responding to that. Mm. And one thing that Alito's draft opinion so expertly laid out was just how much of a sham the Roe decision was, and that's perhaps the hardest hurdle to get over when trying to reveal the truth to someone who is pro-abortion. How can we do this? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, Alito got it right when he stated in his draft that the Constitution makes no reference to abortion. I mean, abortion is not protected under the Constitution. Roe got it wrong, but this court can make it right. The truth is that because of that wrong decision, Roe has caused the death of over 60 million babies of every gender and of every race over the last 50 years, some right up until the moment of birth. Babies with beating hearts, that suck their thumb, that hear their mother sing, that respond to touch and taste and feel excruciating pain when they suffer at the hands of an abortionist. So those who ignore the science and suppress the truth need to be reminded of the humanity of every unborn child. And that's how we need to respond. And you can actually see with your own eyes what science of today reveals. You can go to a, our website at voyageoflife.com to see the undeniable scientific truth and the humanity of the unborn child. And let's talk about that science, which you know so well. On Face the Nation this week, Nancy Pelosi denied that science increasingly reveals the humanity of babies. And she said that overturning Roe versus Wade would be a slap in the face to women. What did you think of her comments? <laughs> well, I sincerely question where Speaker Pelosi has been um, and whether she's been asleep for the past 50 years. I mean, hasn't she heard? Hasn't she seen? Um, it's really unfortunate that after three years of telling America to follow the science, she is now ignoring the science because it's inconvenient to her extreme political position of legalizing abortion right up until the moment of birth. She doesn't have to look far for this evidence of major scientific um, achievement that have revolutionized ultrasound technology, fetal diagnosis, and the science of fetal pain. P sorry, fetal pain. Doctors are now treating babies in utero before birth and some as early as 15 weeks, and at the same gestational age that Speaker Pelosi proclaims a right to kill. I mean, we know that before Roe, the black and white dots of an ultrasound could barely identify the head of an unborn child in the womb, much less show the undeniable humanity of the unborn child that we see today with absolute clarity. So overturning Roe v. Wade would take us out of the same extremist camp as countries like China and North Korea that force and lie, the forced propaganda and lie to the people. I mean, under Roe, America is only one of a handful of countries that allow such extreme abortion up to the point of birth. So, so if Speaker Pelosi really cared about women, she would not allow such extreme laws that kill unborn children and put women at serious risk. And she would not deny the science that has been, that is the truth and has been revealed and that is all around her 
for evidence. Well, Let's thank see. you for all the research that you do on this and the way that you revealed the truth. Dr. Tara Sander Lee from the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Thank you so much. As we have discussed on this show before, overturning Roe versus Wade is by no means the end of our mission to end abortion. What's most likely is that abortions will continue in states controlled by Democrat pro-abortion extremists, while states that have already limited abortion in some capacity will move closer and closer to eradicating abortion within their borders. As states continue to shift one way or the other, it will be vital to keep a pulse on how state legislators and elected officials are moving to promote a culture of life. And we're joined in studio now with one of those elected officials, Mark Burnovich, who currently serves as Attorney General of Arizona and is running for U.S. Senate. Thank you so much for joining me, Attorney General. Thank you, Prudence, for having me in the studio today. Of course. I want to get started by talking to you about Arizona's 15-week limit on abortion that was recently passed. What has been the impact of that law, and what else is Arizona doing to promote and defend life? Well, the legislature in Arizona and the policymakers have been trying to create a culture that protects life. And as Attorney General, I've been doing everything I can to make sure we're protecting the most vulnerable. And whether that's going literally to the Supreme Court and filing briefs in like the Dobbs case, um, pledging or committing to defending these pro the pro-life legislation, or literally right now we have a case pending at the U.S. Supreme Court that's named Isaacson versus Brnovich because I stepped in to defend our um, laws that would prohibit abortions based on genetic defects um, and so we there's a lot of fights going on and I think we're all waiting to see what the Supreme Court actually finally says when they overturn Roe v. Wade. Right. And what will the impact on these other cases being litigated be if Roe v. Wade is overturned, if we get a decision in the Dobbs case? What happens with a case well, like Isaacson? Well, it, it'll it'll be huge. I mean, um, once Roe v. Wade is overturned, uh, you know, hopefully, y you will see, I think we have to win then, the, the our case, the Isaacson uh, versus Brnovich case. We'll have to win on those cases because, you know, it will return to the states and the elected officials instead of unelected judges. Mm -hmm. And I always remind folks that, remember, even people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, thought Roe was a, was a terrible decision. We all recognize the matter of constitutional law. It, it was an absolutely terrible decision. And so it was not only constitutionally suspect, but I think as Americans, we all realize deep down that it was morally bankrupt as well. Right. So now this will allow these important decisions to return back to the ele our elected representatives in the states um, where they can start to do everything they can to protect life. Right, as it should be. Now, talk to me about your pro-life record serving as attorney general. You know, the onus is on state legislators, elected officials in the states on the ground to defend these laws now. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is that, unfortunately, you know, I, I don't like politics. I had never ran for anything before I ran for AG, um, but I was a gang prosecutor before that, a federal prosecutor, and I've spent my career protecting the most vulnerable. And so I, I think it's important to have people that not just talk about issues that have a record. And so, uh, for example, when California went after, um, I, I can't remember the guy's name, Dan, not Dan Line, I can't remember his name, but when they went after him, we opposed the prosecution of him for going in and recording those undercover videos at right. the abortion clinics, the abortion mills. And, you know, we, we literally sent someone into court to, you know, make sure that he had the ability to expose the terrible things that were going on. Um, you know, we've been in court, we supported the right of the Kentucky Attorney General at the U.S. Supreme Court to argue on behalf of defending life when the governor there wouldn't. You know, we literally have a case now pending, Isaacson versus Brnovich. It is named after me because when other elected officials or prosecutors wouldn't, they, they wanted to agree to a stay. They said that they would go ahead and put the law on hold. I said, no, we're going to enforce the law. We're going to protect life. Mm -hmm. And that's why I got sued and the case is pending now. So my hope is, is that once they overturn Roe v. Wade, then we should be able to win on that case as well, or we'll get the um, that law to spring back into effect. So you you have to keep fighting, and you know you start to list off all the cases we've been involved in. I mean, heck, we last year we sued the Biden administration when they. Uh, being a 12-state coalition sued the Biden administration mm -hmm. when they tried to uh, provide funding to, you know, ab abortion clinics, public taxpayer dollars. And so, you know, we sued them over that. So there are a lot of fights that we have been involved in. Yes. And we got to continue to do everything we can mm. to stand up for life, stand up for our values. And as conservatives, and I'm a conservative, it, we cannot be afraid to say this is why we believe this and this is what 
um, you know, we want to take place in the public square, whether it's our representatives, whether it's our AGs, we have to be engaged in political society in order to effectuate the change. Right, and we have to be able to answer those tough questions. And I wanted to shift gears for our last question to get your thoughts on something else happening in Arizona right now. Clarence Dixon is a man in Arizona who has been charged with brutally murdering a college student in the 70s, and he's been sentenced to death. His execution is now underway. Talk to me about how, as Attorney General, you justified that sentence given your pro-life beliefs. You know, to me, Prudence, there is nothing contradictory about being in support of the death penalty and also protecting um, the unborn because it all comes down to protecting innocent life. And we know that historically, there's, there's a lot of scholars, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas and, you know, other, you know, even biblical scholars that have said that society has a right to defend itself. And when you have people, like in the case you're talking about, I won't even say this guy's name, but he had brutally raped and killed a woman in the late 70s. He's gone through the appellate process, the federal courts, the state courts. He's had lawyers. Um, he, he literally raped multiple women. And I just think at that point, he has given up his right to live in a civilized society. And in some ways, I think it shows how much we value life by saying that that person who brutally raped and killed a woman, raped other women, he has given up his right to live in a civilized society because we value life and safety so much. And at the end of the day, I tell folks that, look, the death penalty is the law. I'm a big blue, big believer in the rule of law, and that is the law, and I've spoken to victims, the victims' families, and they want some closure, they want some justice, and this is my way to help the victims, and I think too often, we focus on the defendants and not the victims um, of these or their families of these terrible crimes. Mm. Well, I appreciate your take on that and the work that you do to defend the unborn. Thank you so much, Attorney General Mark Brnovich. Thank you. EWTN has launched a new initiative to promote the culture of life through prayer. In this month of May that we dedicate to honoring our Mother Mary, we're asking you, our EWTN family, to pray the rosary frequently and fervently for the overturn of Roe versus Wade and an end to abortion in America and throughout the world. We pray that each day we can continue to rebuild a culture that respects our families, our faith, and the right to life. Coming up, a pro-life group in Wisconsin is attacked, and we're tracking other instances of vandalism by pro-abortion groups in reaction to the Dobbs leak. I speak out. Plus, a new film seeks to educate its viewers about the truth behind abortion. We speak to the film's director next. EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Prudence Robertson. Pro-abortion activists have violently taken to the streets in reaction to the fact that they could lose big at the Supreme Court, going so far as to commit arson at a pro-life advocacy center. That is this week's Speak Out segment. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been hearing news of windows being smashed in at pro-life pregnancy centers and riots in the streets led by abortion activists. Now, a pro-life, pro-family group called Wisconsin Family Action has been directly targeted by arsonists who tossed two Molotov cocktails at their headquarters. While the investigation is still ongoing as to whether the Molotov cocktails actually ignited, the arsonists set fire elsewhere in the facility and succeeded in burning down a portion of the building. They also threatened the group's employees with a message and spray paint on the wall, if abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either. It sadly comes as no surprise. Pro-abortion people have no respect for unborn children. Why should they respect the lives of born people who disagree with them? They have forced Justice Alito into hiding, protested outside the houses of other Supreme Court justices, vandalized Catholic churches, and more. This violence is appalling. The pro-abortion political regime, led by Speaker Nancy Pelosi, President Joe Biden, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and others, has convinced these people that if they lose their so-called right to abortion, they will cease to be free. The truth is that the findings in Roe are exceptionally weak, and Americans, possibly soon, will no longer be handcuffed by this legal sham of a decision. Praise God for that.
The Matter of Life is a new pro-life film that seeks to share and educate viewers about the truth behind abortions. The documentary film emphasizes the humanity of the unborn child through expert analysis and facts. It also features powerful stories from women, former abortion clinic workers, historians, and religious leaders. The film will hit theaters for two nights on Monday, May 16th, and Tuesday, May 17th. Joining us now via Skype is Tracy Robinson, director and producer of The Matter of Life. Tracy, thanks for joining us. Can you tell us about your journey, how you went from being pro-abortion to pro-life, and how your experience moved you to work on this film? Yeah, so I, uh, in 2016, I was doing videos for a preg pregnancy resource center in California, and I was in the mushy middle, um, but I loved what the center was doing to help women uh, with their unplanned pregnancies. And it wasn't until my friends at the pregnancy center invited me to an apologetics conference, and the topic was the case against abortion. And in less than two hours, the message uh, just clarified for me the, the true humanity of the unborn child. Uh, from the moment of conception and the, the, the whole um, uh, reality of what abortion does really struck me. Mm. And so I immediately felt compelled to make a documentary uh, because I knew there were so many people in my shoes, uh, young adults who had never heard the message before, clearly. And uh, they grew up in public schools, uh, even went through church, and um, uh, and the family never broached the topic, uh, and so they've just never heard it from these sources, mm. and they've just allowed the culture to uh, inform them and shape their worldview. Uh, so I had so many questions when I learned, finally learned the science. I wanted to know how we got to this point in our society. I didn't know anything about Roe v. Wade or the truth behind Planned Parenthood, nothing. Mm. Um, and I was an evangelical Christian in my late 20s. And so I began to research and I started to find these amazing stories um, and uh, learned about Roe v. Wade and uh, learned about the amazing multifaceted pro-life movement uh, to learn more and find tickets in their area. Good to know. Tracy Robinson, director and producer of The Matter of Life, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. And that does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Prudence Robertson. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.